Hello everyone. It has been a while since I have made a video for random map scripting, and since then, Definitive Edition has come out, and with it has come some new and interesting random map scripting features which I will go over in this video. So before we get started, uh, we first need to find the uh, random custom random map folder for the Definitive Edition, and wherever you have the game installed, it would be in this path, resources, common, and then random map scripts is here. And then in addition to that, if you go back into this common folder under strings, key value, you open up this file. And among other things, you have all these various strings for all the syntax for the sections, commands, and various other things that um, the random map script generator will be using. If you're familiar with random map scripting or have watched some of my previous videos, much of this should look familiar to you. Um, but towards this end of the list, we can see that there are some extra um, strings for the new attributes for Definitive Edition. Um, I'm not going to go over exactly all of these. I think some of them are pretty self-explanatory and some of them just aren't very useful. Um, just for reference. so. This is the official documentation provided by Forgotten Empires. Um, you can give this a read if you'd like. Um, it hasn't ha um, gone through much updating in regards to the documentation since the game's release. And some other features have been added since then. Um, and this is fairly informative, but it doesn't always give you the best um, tips for applying these in a practical way with your maps. And that's what I'm going to hope to um, showcase here. So, uh, without further ado, I'll go straight into a sample map. So this is just one I had set up. So basically just what we're seeing here is a um, just players in a circle with a ring of trees in the middle. And right now, this is set up using random placement with um, fairly few constraints. And we can, when we're dealing with random placement, um, we can see that there's a, quite a bit of variation in how the um, players will spawn relative to their, the other players or the location on the map. See, for example, this green player is fairly close to the edge of the map, where, for example, this um, gray player is fairly closer to the middle. Um, and that can be useful in certain situations, but um, we can also get into situations where, like for example, this red player, he's spawning close enough to the middle of the map where his base is starting to get very constrained. And so there can be a lot of situations in which this variation in starting location can be a problem. And so the first thing I wanted to talk about was circle radius. So this is a new feature in the definitive edition. So with circle radius, you can add an extra degree of constraint to player lands. So the syntax is basically circle radius and it takes two arguments. The first is the radius, the distance from the center, which constitutes how the player how far the players will spawn from the center and then the second argument um, has to do with how closely it will ad adhere to that radius so lower numbers so uh, for example zero it will not deviate at all from staying 43 percent of the map's length away from the center and we can take a look at that here so right now we can see a much more consistent spacing for all the players. They're all spawning the same distance away from the center as all the other players. And if we increase this second argument, increase the variance to say a factor of 10, then we can see that um, there's a bit more variance in the starting locations of the players. See, this guy is fairly close to the, the wood line, 
and this guy is um, much more closer to the edge of the map. But still, it's a bit more consistent than random placement. And if we say increase it even more, up to 20, and we see even more variation. So that's one of those useful features. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was this attribute terrain mask. And so as the name implies, uh, terrain mask is an attribute for um, terrain generation commands. So if we go to a sample map, uh, we can see this being used here. So I'm creating the terrain leaves and the base terrain is dirt and the terrain mask is one. And what this does is that in the definitive edition, it allows you to create a whole new terrain based on two different terrains. So when we take a look at this terrain here, it is leaves masked on top of dirt, which has a different texture than uh, leaves just by themselves. And that can be a useful tool. For example, if you wanted to um, give a map some aesthetic appeal, um, you could do something like this and if for example you're using a terrain statement for an object like place on terrain dirt you can you can still uh, use a terrain mask to give you to give yourself some um, bit of aesthetic appeal and this terrain will still technically be dirt so any object that have a will have a place on sp specific terrain dirt will still be satisfied and it could be able to place here even though it has a different texture. And then let's just say, for example, um, well, this particular example um, is blending two terrains of the exact same properties. But um, let's say, for example, we were trying to blend two terrains with different properties. Say, for example, ice. Ice and dirt do not have the same properties. So let's take a look at what that does. So when we're blending two terrains of different properties, um, you're probably wondering what are the end properties of the terrain going to be? And it depends on the value of the terrain mask attribute. So if we take a look here, the terrain mask value for this is one, which means um, ice is being placed, we'll, we'll, we'll say um, over top of the dirt. And then if we try to place a building here, for example, the ice is purely aesthetic and it's not affecting the placement of the building at all. And in contrast, if we specify this terrain mask value to be two, let's see what this does. So now we can see that um, it has a slightly different texture and even on the mini map, it's um, the terrain patches are showing up looking like ice instead of dirt. And that's because when you set the terrain mass value to 2, that's, for example, um, um, creating the terrain underneath the base terrain. And if we try to create a building on there, it doesn't work anymore. So um, just to recap that when you specify the terrain mask value of 1, um, you can say, for example, that this ice is being overlaid on top of the base terrain. And if you use a terrain mask of two, then this ice is being put underneath the base terrain. And whichever terrain is underneath, it will, the end, the end result of the terrain will take those properties. I hope that makes sense. And in the same vein, um, we have this other um, attribute base layer which can go into the land generation section, similar to base terrain, you can also specify base layer and specify a certain terrain there. And then similar to the way it behaves in terrains, it can um, generate a layer um, over top of whatever base terrain your map is. So um, we'll get rid of this for now and then revert um, this back to the way it was. So this was what leaves. Okay. 
and then we'll put that back to the way it was and then focus on the next um, attribute that I wanted to talk about and these next ones are focusing on um, attributes for objects and the first one um, well we can take a look at these first I guess so we can place on forest zone avoid forest zone these are pretty self-explanatory so when you're dealing with an object you can give it an attribute of place on forest zone and it will spawn um, within one tile of any given forest so anywhere here is fair game and then um, avoid forest zone is pretty much the opposite so it will avoid spawning in within one tile of a forest zone so it'll avoid it there and then similarly Avoid cliff zone is, you know, pretty intuitive. It will avoid a cliff. But the next thing I really wanted to talk about was this attribute, find closest. So this is an attribute that can be given to object commands that will find the closest spot to place this object um, with reference to the player lands that still satisfies the other attributes in that particular object command. So let's take a look at um, an example here. So in the objects generation section, we have this create object command, and it's a flag. It's going to set place for every player, and the terrain to place on is going to be dirt, and we have the attribute find closest. So let's take a look and see what this does. So for this purple player here, it places a flag. The closest spot it can find while still being placed on dirt. And Similarly, for the teal player, this is the closest spot that satisfies the um, stipulation that it has to be placed on the um, dirt. And then similarly for all the other players in the game, they each have a flag, um, which is just close enough in this inner circle here. And if you are astute, you will also notice that also in this command, are two other attributes which specify the actor area. And the actor area is um, a, another set of attributes for um, these object statements. And what actor areas allow you to do is to place objects in relation to other objects. So let's take a look at what that means. So when we have an actor area assigned to a specific object. Uh, we can specify the actor area radius and then we can place other objects in relation to that actor area. For example, this next object command has a actor area to place in attribute of nine. So when we take a look at what that does, it places a town center right near this flag. The actor area to place in ID of 9 is what's matching the actor area of the flag that we placed earlier. And since that actor area radius of actor area 9 is 0, that means that the town center is going to be placed pretty much directly on top of that flag. And then we can also see that we can, um, in a way, chain actor areas. So this town center that was placed in actor area 9 is given a new actor area with the ID of one. And that actor area one is going to have a larger radius. The radius is nine. And so we can place new objects with respect to this town center, actor area one, with respect to the larger radius. And then you can see similarly here, I'm creating other flags with respect to this actor area nine. And the only difference between this and the town center is that the actor areas that are created have different radiuses. Um, so this one has an actor area radius of 5. This one has a radius of 7. And these are used to keep um, objects from spawning too close to this um, town center. So when we're creating objects with respect to actor areas, we, we've seen before that we can place in specific actor areas. So this is going to be the villagers are going to be placed in actor area 1 actor area one is the town center so it will spawn within nine tiles of this town center and then this other attribute avoid actor area three 
actor area 3 was here, and its radius was 7. So that means it will spawn outside of this 7 tile radius, but within this 9 tile radius. And we can see what this did here. So these villagers are spawning within the confines of this new base, so to speak, but it's not spawning too close. So as you can imagine, these attributes are quite powerful and they can be used in a lot of different ways and can lead to very many possibilities for creating maps. This is just an example and I'm sure you can let your imagination lead you to other ideas. And then the next new feature that I wanted to go over was this one, which is called Second Object. And this is an attribute that can be given to an object command that will spawn another object um, on top of the first object you've generated in that specific command. And what's special about this is the second object will always spawn. And that may seem a little confusing. So let's go look at an example here. So um, let's just say, for example, that we wanted to put a fishing ship for every player right in this middle here. And now, if we think about it for a second, there's a rule regarding the placement of objects in that you cannot place a player object in an area that is separated from the players by a restricted terrain. And since there are m many terrains, for example, this terrain is restricted for fishing ships, there probably shouldn't be a way that we can place a fishing ship in this middle area here. So let's try and test that. So we'll go fishing ship. Set place for every player and we'll terrain to place on attribute of deep water. So let's see what that did. And as we expected, the fishing ship was not able to be placed because of that rule I mentioned earlier. So where does second object come in? So let's just say instead of a fishing ship, we're going to spawn an object that is not restricted to land terrains. In fact, it has no terrain restrictions whatsoever. For example, this flag has no terrain restrictions whatsoever. So if we place the flag on deep water, that should be able to be placed no problem. And as we can see here, no issues there. And, in, and where the second object comes in is that we can second object second object fishing ship And now we are still able to place, since we were able to place the flags there, we're able to in turn place the fishing ships there. Now you can, the flag is just what I use for reference purposes. If you wanted to use an invisible object, it would probably look more seamless, but that's just what I used for the example. So that's one of the uh, uses of the second object attribute um, with respect to um, removing some of the restrictions for objects that would otherwise exist. Um, but there is a, another practical use for this um, attribute, which is to give extra restriction to objects that would otherwise be freely placed. And um, to do that, I'm going to take a look at another map. So this is the map in question. And basically, DE uh, made a rather strange tr change to the data in the sense that in the original game, boars were restricted to beach terrain. And so, um, going back to the rules of objects generation, since there's a ring of beach terrain um, encompassing this whole middle section, it in the original game, it shouldn't have been possible to place boars um, in this middle which would be separated from the players. But um, DE changed this so that 
beach terrain is no longer a restricted terrain for boars. So this kind of problem is occurring where the boars are able to spawn in this middle section which is separated from the players and inaccessible. Luckily there is a way around this and to do that we are going to use an object that is still restricted for beach terrain which is forage. And now you may be wondering why that's useful because we're trying to place boars not forage. We already have a separate um, command for forage bushes. And the reason we're doing that is because forage bushes are still restricted for beach terrain, which means they have to spawn in this area that is accessible for players. And we can use the second object attribute to create the boar in a spot where it will always be accessible to the players. And now we have the situation here where we have a berry bush with a boar stuck inside of it. And to get rid of the berry bush, we can use a resource delta attribute of minus 125. So what resource delta does is it affects the um, storage capacity of the resource in question. So since forage bushes have a capacity of 125 food, this resource delta of minus 125 reduces that food count to zero. So when we, um, it won't look like this in the scenario editor, but for example, if we go to and test this in a random map game, And hide out. Well, that didn't work because I spelled resource wrong. My bad. Let's try again. Resource. Um, so let's try that again. Try to find a boar around here. Bye. Bye. There. So the boar is placed, and it's, and we can notice that the forage bush was completely removed because of that resource delta. So now we have a resulting situation in which the boars on the map will always be placed in an area that's accessible to the players and not within that um, ring of trees. And then the last couple things I wanted to mention were these attributes regarding Gaia objects. So when you have an attribute um, or say you have an object that's a Gaia object and you don't want the players to be able to capture that. Um, you can use this attribute, set Gaia unconvertible, to make that object neutral um, throughout the whole game. Um, and this can be, for example, useful if you want an area of the map to be temporarily inaccessible for players, or perhaps you maybe just want some aesthetic things going on that don't really um, gain any benefit to players just based on how they bump into those particular objects. So for example, this wall will remain neutral throughout the whole game and player and any player will be able to attack it with a military unit. And then this other attribute called set Gaia civilization is one that also applies to Gaia objects. Um, and this will basically set the architecture of buildings based on what civilization is set to. And then it also may factor in some civilization bonuses like the HP of some units and buildings. So um, the way this works is that we need a numerical ID for whatever civilization we choose. And to find out which ID is associated with which civilization, the 
Definitive Edition comes with this useful tool under the Tools Builds folder. It's got its own advanced genie editor. And then with this in mind, under the Civilization tab, we see all the names of the civilizations with all the numerical IDs next to them. So if you wanted to set Gaia civilization to be, um, for example, Byzantines, you would specify set Gaia civilization, leave a space, and then type set in. Um, and then this, for example, should only be used in one in one object command. If, for example, you have, well, let, let's open up the map. So if we have, for example, set Gaia civilization here in this particular object command, seven, and then we have here, set Gaia Civilization 8, it, it means that this, um, this first um, line of code will be ignored. It will only take the last input that was, that was specified. Um, so I think that's about all the things I wanted to cover with this video. As always, I hope you've learned something and I'll see you next time.